pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon in Boston, where I'll be covering tonight's Game 6. Tony Kornheiser in my own home, where I will be falling asleep roughly halfway through tonight's Game 6. You know, I used to, as you know, for really big games, we were both a lot younger. I would call you and say, wake up. Carol would put you on the phone. I'd, I'd wake you up. I don't do that anymore because I've, I've just given up. I mean, you just, you're just yeah. asleep. I don't even try to wake rouse you anymore. Yeah, thank God for Sports Center in the morning. <laughs> Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, Rory McIlroy starts strong. The Avalanche wins game one. And Kendrick Perkins joins us for five good minutes. But we begin today with tonight's game six in Boston. It's an elimination game for the Celtics, who have lost two in a row and trail in the finals three to two. After game five, Steve Kerr exhorted the Warriors to end this in Boston. Wilbon, you are there. What are the chances the Warriors indeed do that? Tony, if we go chances, I'm going to say 45%. I mean, I'm looking at a fairly even night here. I think both teams are going to try to, you know, do what they can to end the series, which means for Boston extending it and for Golden State ending it. And, you know, I think that the Warriors, I know this from sort of listening, the Warriors think they've discovered something. They thought that going into game four. They were right. But it was a little odd because Steph Curry went absolutely crazy and had the 43-point game, one of the great games in the history of the finals. And then they had the ensemble effort, you know, in game five. And they were able to win that game to take the lead. But, Tony, Boston's won tough games. Boston's won a couple of elimination games. They did this against Milwaukee. They successfully yeah. won a game seven in Miami. So they're not scurred. I mean, the Celtics aren't walking in there thinking, oh, my God, you know, our backs are against the wall. They are against the wall, but the Celtics aren't thinking like that, nor should they. So I got the Celtics winning this game. I don't think that Jason Tatum has to score 50 points. I'm not one of those guys. And I just think the Celtics will have their best ensemble effort tonight and win this game. But do I am I knocking Golden State out of contention to win this thing mm -hmm. tonight and end it? No, I'm not. So I don't have any particular feel for this game. But it is hard for me to believe that Boston will lose three games in a row. Agree. And given the fact that the Boston Celtics in their lifetime of the franchise have been to the finals 21 times and they've only been knocked out in Boston once, it is again hard for me to believe that. As you've mentioned, they went on in games six and seven and beat Milwaukee, the defending champions. We've seen them do that. The case I will make for the Warriors is this, and please help me out with this because I want to make sure I get the dates right on these things. I believe in 2016, which was the year they won 73 games and they were defending champions, they were up three to one against Cleveland, right? Three to one. That's and right. They lost that series. That was a series, I believe, where Draymond Green was banned from playing in Game 5 because of something that happened in Game 4, which I'm sure he reflects on and takes personally. So my feeling, the case I make for the Warriors is this. They don't want history to repeat itself. They don't want to yeah. lose a lead 3-2, not 3-1. They don't want that. It is better for them to win now. And so yes. that is the, although I, yes. although I lean towards the Celtics, that is the chance the collective historical chance that I give to Golden State tonight. So, I'm with you. You know Steve Kerr's reminded them. Yeah, we're great. We've won three. We can have a little mini dynasty here. But we also lost a game seven at home. So let's not yeah. let it get to that just counting on game seven at home. They've blown one of That's those already. We've seen it. I was there. So yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. I think that nugget, it's more than a nugget, I think that works in Golden State's favor to some degree. I'm, I'm with you on that. Let's move to the Stanley Cup final. Avalanche going one up on the Lightning last night. Colorado scored three times on Andre Vasilevsky in the first period. Then a fourth in overtime to beat Tampa Bay 4-3. What a rousing game. Lightning coach John Cooper said, quote, I don't think by a country mile that we gave them our best game, and we still had a chance to pull it out, close quote. Tone. Is Cooper right to view game one's loss so optimistically? John Cooper is a professional coach. He's worked with these people for a while. He knows what he's supposed to say to get the best out of these people. Tampa Bay has won two straight Stanley Cups. Mike, they are so good that in the playoffs to this point, they have not had home ice at all 
and they've won all the series. So I think it's easy for Cooper to say what he said, and I think it's easy for his players to listen. My position is this, that at the moment, Colorado has one victory and Tampa Bay has no victories. And at the moment, Colorado is 13-2 and two in these playoffs, and Tampa Bay is 12-6, and six, and they just got four goals on Vasilevsky, who I think you think is the best goalie in hockey. Yeah. So I've sat here in his chair on this show for a few times, and I've said, not that I think Tampa Bay, that not that I think Colorado's going to win the series, but I think they should be fi- favored. And you, Will Bond, and your boy Messier laughed at me yesterday and said, no, 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 Tampa Bay should be favored. So I am going to bask in this moment for as long as I can. Tony. Vasilevsky has given up goals like he did last night, sort of a bunch for him to give up four, even with one in OT. He's done that. It's usually game one. He gave up. I mean, they, they lost five nothing, Tampa did, to, to start the playoffs. What, what, what does Vasilevsky do as we, get, as we move on? He becomes a stone wall and impenetrable. That's right. So, listen, by the That's way. Right. What a great game last night, Tony. And when Tampa came back from down 3-1 to tie that game with two goals and what seemed like 30 seconds, I get seriously, it was a stand-up and scream-out-loud moment even just watching the TV because you're like, these are the champs. Here they come. And I'm still sort of rooting for the avalanche. I'm just as perverse, me rooting against Tampa like this. But I admire the hell out of them, and I fully see them coming back to tie this thing, whether they tie it at 1-1 or whether they tie it at 2-2. I, I just, I don't see last night, and yes, Cooper should be optimistic. He's got the champs. Why wouldn't he be? That's right. I'm just going to say this. It's very hard to keep Colorado off the board. Yeah, they score a goal and a half yeah. more than Tampa Their in these playoffs. The first period they had knocked, two goals the in the back. first 10 minutes, right? Yeah. So it's going to be hard to yep. stop them. It will be. The United States Open at the Country Club in Brookline, Massachusetts began today, and after the morning round was done, Rory McIlroy was tied for the lead with a 367. Big names Colin Morikawa and defending Open champion John Rahm were close by at minus one. McIlroy has been the PGA Tour's greatest champion in the war of words with the Saudi Tour. Wilbon, what is your biggest takeaway from round one? Well, it has nothing to do with Liv or even Rory. My greatest takeaway from round one as I sit here, Tone, about, I don't know, 20 minutes or so from Brookline, from the, from yeah. the country club, yeah. I'm going to go to the glasses to quote Anthony Kornheiser. And, Tony, my takeaway is that the names you expect, Rom, Anthony Scott, Colin Morikawa, those guys are closer down to 15 Adam to Scott. 20. Yes, Rory Adam's- and Matthew Fitzpatrick, Northwestern Zone, they're in the top 10 right now. But, Tone, the names, Hayden Buckley, Callum Tarrant, Adam Hadwin, we know who Adam Hadwin is, and we maybe even know who Aaron Wise is. These are all good Good. players, Tone. They're worthy during the week on the PGA Tour. You don't have any of those guys winning the United States Open. I know you will enough to know. You don't have any of them winning it, and I don't have any of them winning it, but they are in contention after a day, and they populate that top 20. Also, Rams, guys, we don't think of as major championship winners. Yeah, they'll be washed off the board, many of them, by Saturday. That's how it works in the U.S. Open all the time. My biggest takeaway is the inherent drama on the scoreboard. It's not going to matter so much who wins this thing, ultimately, as what side that person is on. Is he on the PGA Tour side? Is he on the Saudi Tour side? There is a public relations battle going on right now. The PGA Tour loves Rory McIlroy. Now, they love John Rahm, and they love Colin Morikawa, and they love Justin Thomas, too, but they love Rory the most. They were so happy when Rory won the Canadian Open last week, so happy when he took a shot at Greg Norman. I don't know how this is going to end up. I, I'm pretty sure Phil Mickelson's not going to be there on Sunday because I think no. he was plus five that was on his, his first, first round. Wow. But I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this, that if it comes down on the last day to say Rory McIlroy – against Dustin Johnson, or Justin Thomas against Sergio Garcia, or Colin Morikawa against Bryson DeChambeau. You're going to have a morality play out there. It's going to be larger than most majors even, because it'll be a morality play, because everybody's waiting to see what this means for the future of golf. Let's take a break. 
You can put the prompter back on. I can read it, or I can just look at a black screen. Okay, coming up, we will ask Kendrick Perkins what he would tell Jason Tatum tonight if they were teammates. And we'll also ask him about the Celtics' incessant complaining to and about the refs. You watched the golf, whining. right? Did you watch Rory in the sand trap bang the yeah. sand twice with a club? Yeah. Did you watch him yeah. throw his club on his second shot on his last hole because he put like his spinach on the right? Pardon the interruption is presented by Corona Extra. Find the fine life. Live La Vida Maspina. Part of Happy Hour and in part by Verizon. 5G. Watching Pardon the Interruption. Presented by Corona Extra. Part of Happy Hour. Let's get back into tonight's game six of the NBA Finals with our BFF, Kendrick Perkins. We're going to start with this question. <laughs> the Celtics... The Celtics guarded the pick and roll more aggressively in game five, and Steph Curry was 0 for 9 from three. How likely is it, or is it not likely at all, that a defensive adjustment is going to work like that again? You know what? I don't I don't expect Steph Curry to go 0 for 9, but I, I don't expect him to have 43 points either like he did in game four in the garden. Look, I think this is all about the Celtics. I think the Celtics are going to come out here tonight. I think they're going to play lights out on both ends of the floor. And look, their defense has been pretty damn good throughout these finals. It's the offense that they've been struggling with, the turnovers. Uh, Jason Tatum not being aggressive, trying to draw fouls, not get down here attacking the basket. So, I, you know, if Steph come out and have 20 to 25 points, cool. The Celtics are still going to win by double figures. I think it's more about their offense, less so their defense. Well, Kendrick, let's zero in on the person that you mentioned that we're all talking about here in Boston, Jason Tatum. Perk, is Tatum the kind of player that we should be expecting in a big game like this to get 35, 38, 40 points? Is he that transcendent player uh, or are we expecting too much of him and therefore calling him inconsistent? No, he is. Uh, last time I checked, he's first team All-NBA. He did make the All-Star team this year. You know, he, he's a superstar caliber player. We watched him drop 46 against the defending champs on the road. Here's the thing about Jason Tatum and a lot of young up-and-coming superstars that a lot of people don't know is that they need that veteran guy to what we call put that key in his back. We saw Ray John Rondo do that with Anthony Davis when they won when they won the championship with the Lakers, I believe, two years ago. See, if I was in that locker room and I was Jason Tatum a veteran, I would tell him, hey bro, first of all, we got your back like car seats. Okay. I would tell him that first thing first. And then secondly, I would tell him, hey, look. Hey, man, you a bad man. Go out there and do what you do best and attack downhill. Get to the rack, snatch the screws out the basket, get to the free throw line, and take us home. All right, so that's good advice, let's say, for Jason Tatum. Now I'm going to ask you to advise one more guy in Celtic Green. What would you tell M.A. Udoka, Perk, about the refs? Because there's been a lot of dissatisfaction more from the Boston side, it seems, with the refereeing. What would you tell him going into this game six in the Garden about dealing with them tonight? Well, I would tell him and the whole team, hey, look, don't look for calls in the NBA Finals, period. That's the one thing I love about the NBA officials, right, in the NBA. They get it right during the Finals. They get a veteran crew. The veteran crew is going to let you play it out they're going to let some calls go. They're going to let you play physical. Don't depend on the whistle. Look, your friend, Will Bourne, Doc Rivers, my guy, a father figure to me, said, always used to tell us, don't leave the game in an official's hands. Meaning, if you take care of your business, then you don't have to worry about the whistle. So if I'm in that locker room, I'm telling them, hey, look, we have to play through everything. If it was easy, then everyone could achieve it. All right, Kendrick, we're going to get you out of here on this. I believe I heard in your earlier answer that you are leaning towards Boston winning this game. You believe their defense is sound, and if their offense is good, I believe you think they will 
win by as much as double digits. If I'm right about that, then I'm going to ask you about Game 7 and how you think this series is going to end. And if I'm wrong about that with Boston in Game 6, tell me now. Well, look, I, I, look, Tony, listen. I don't see the Warriors coming in here and winning this Game 6. It's going to be rowdy. I think Ime Yudoka is going to have the Celtics fired up. And the Celtics should be fired up. Listen, to the, to the, to the players out there, right, on the, on the Boston Celtics, if you think you were mad when Kyrie Irving stepped on Lucky, just imagine how pissed off you would be if you watched him get drowned in, in champagne, right? So, so I think it's going seven. I picked this. I picked this series to go seven. I got Boston in seven. And again, the Celtics have been here before. We watched them be down three-two to the defending champs. They went on the road in game six, got the win, came back home, and closed it out. Then we watched them in the Eastern Conference Finals. What happened? Miami came in here. Jimmy Butler had a, a, a historical performance. They, Miami tied the series up. They went on the road in Miami and closed the game seven out. I would never count out this Boston Celtic team. They're going to win tonight. Here, here. Thank you, Kendrick. Always a pleasure here, here. when you're with us. Thank you so much. Perk, you the best. See you in a few minutes. I appreciate y'all, Ledgers. All right. <laughs> let's, let's take one last break, but still to come, Sue Bird makes an announcement about her future. And the Braves and Yankees both continue to roll. Tony, you see that 160-foot Yankee home run to right field last night? Only ballpark no, it would have I... been out of is Yankee Stadium. Did you see that one? Pardon the interruption is presented by Corona Extra. Find the fine life. Live La Vida Maspina. Part of Happy Hour. Happy time, people. Happy 52nd birthday, Phil Mickelson. How oddly appropriate that it is Phil's birthday when the Open begins and Phil finds himself in the middle of the active volcano golf has become. Lefty, all-time great. Six majors. The oldest major winner at 51. 45 career wins, tied for eighth all time. He's outgoing, funny, he loves to talk. But at his press conference Monday, Phil was guarded and defensive and somber, and he looked like a prisoner as he tried to explain and defend his decision to take the Saudi money and join the Saudi, Saudi tour. What a shame if this is the lasting impression of Mickelson as an exile in his own time. Man, he played like he was going into exile in his first nine holes at the U.S. Open today. Not, not fun to see that. Happy anniversary, Phil Jackson. On this day 23 years ago, the Lakers hired Jackson as head coach after he had taken a year off following his run with the Chicago Bulls. Jackson won six championships in Chicago. Ultimately, he won five more in Los Angeles. After Los Angeles, Jackson went to New York to run the Knicks, a homecoming that was widely cheered as Jackson had played on the Knicks when they won their only championships. Didn't work. The Knicks have a way of doing that to people. Jackson is now advising Jeannie Buss, the owner of the Lakers and his former fiance. If the relationship seems a bit unusual, remember it's Hollywood. Tony, what was your favorite incarnation of Phil? The guy you covered when you were both young and crazy decades ago? Phil with the Bulls, Phil with the Lakers. Your fave, which one? No, no, as a player. He was the greatest in the locker room. Could talk about anything. He's the smartest guy. He really was. Happy trails to extra bases for Jose Iglesias. Watch as Cleveland left fielder Stephen Kwan covers 65 feet in four seconds on a dead sprint to the warning track to rob the Rockies hitter, save two runs and the game. Kwan wasn't the only outfielder to make a great catch. Mike Trout went over the wall to rob the Dodgers of a three-run homer. And Trout wasn't the only angel to make a big play. Shohei Otani tripled with one out in the ninth to break up Tyler Anderson's no-hitter. Dodgers manager Dave Roberts went against form, left Anderson in to 123 pitches to get the no-no. But true to their season, we show highlights of Trout and Otani, and the Angels still lost. Tony, they're spooked. And you don't even mention your guy Rendon. I mean, they got players, they got names, they got successful guys on, the, on that team, and they seem spooked. Can't get anything right for a long term. The Phillies responded to a managerial change great, and the Angels have not, right? They That's have right. not. That's right. It's not that simple all the time. Let's go to the big finish. Sue Let's Bird announced that this will be her final season. Your thoughts? Is she on the Mount Rushmore? She's one of the nominees. 
Cheryl Swoop, Cheryl Miller, Diana Taurasi, Cynthia Cooper, maybe Leslie and Lieberman. But she's on that list, one of the all-time greats. Luis Garcia, Phil Maton, both threw immaculate innings in the same game for the Strolls last night against the Rangers. Were you impressed? I'm impressed that you make lists no matter what we talk about. Yeah, they you like that? They both got the same three batters. Nine pitches, three strikeouts, same batters. The Short Mavericks list. traded four players and the number 26 pick to the Rockets for your boy Christian Wood. That is significant. Christian Wood is going to blossom playing with Luka. That's going to be formidable. Great acquisition. Pete Alonzo with the Mets has 59 RBI, putting them on pace for 152. Is that a big deal? Don't tell me what the pace is. When you get to 152, let me know. Last one, the Braves have won 14 straight. The Yankees are now 30 over, which is the bigger deal. I'm going to tell you about pace. The Yankees are now two games better than the 27 Yankees. That's the gold standard. Sorry, I'm telling you about pace. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheiser. Ruth and Garrett, come on. You're not going to squash that. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. Check out NBA Countdown at 8 Eastern on ESPN. And again at 8.30, different show on ABC. Now, here's SportsCenter. They paying you double for two shows.